Wow. Actually, this is, uh, so as you may have noticed, we, we flipped the order. Um, actually, I think that was quite a good idea <laughs> um, because hopefully I am going to now talk about a project where some of the concerns and some of the issues that were raised in the previous paper have been addressed or are not the case, hopefully. So hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, thank you to the panel for inviting me to speak this afternoon. It has indeed been a long trek, the 200 metres from the Arab office just over the road. <laughs> and I'm really excited to speak to you today about a project that Arab have been involved in, um, in the capacity of uh, independent environmental and social consultants. Um, so my name is Ruth Humphreys and I'm a senior consultant. I sit within the uh, Midlands Specialist Environmental Services team. My pre-consultancy background uh, is a mix of UK field archaeology and also working as a field archaeologist in Egypt and Sudan and um, working as a researcher in Egypt and Sudan as well. Um, so I joined this project, which is uh, normally referred to as the Tanzania Standard Gauge Railway, in the latter stages of the monitoring for lots one and two. And I'm currently involved in the environmental, social, health and safety due diligence for uh, lots three and four. In this presentation, I hope to shine a spotlight on examples of good practice, um, which were observed during the monitoring of lots one and two. Um, where the project team have exceeded compliance, expectations of compliance with international standards. I'm not going to get into a debate about how relevant the standards are today, um, but this is what the lenders have chosen, um, where um, they, which they have, they have often exceeded these expectations whilst working in exceptionally challenging circumstances. Uh, this success was achieved as a result of early uh, development and implementation of robust project risk management systems and strategies. Uh, and I'm also going to, and so to illustrate that, I'm going to focus on two case study examples where these strategies were taken from the page and successfully implemented on the ground. So before I continue any further, I also want to thank my colleague Pete Gabriel for his help in producing this presentation and generally mentoring me through the entire introduction to the world of ESDD and independent monitoring, and also to my colleagues on the ground. Um, for the Tanzania Railways Corporation and Maisri Chaka for uh, the Turkish contractor Yapi Mukhazy, who carried out a lot of this work. So, here is Tanzania. Um, and I'm going to read this verbatim because there are a lot of acronyms in here, so please bear with me. Uh, the Arab Climate and Sustainability Services Independent Environmental and Social Advisory Team are working in the, as the Independent Environmental and Social Consultant, um, supporting the delivery of the Dar al Salaam to Makutapura um, Standard Gauge Railway, lots one and two in Tanzania. So the project itself is um, the construction of a brand new 500 kilometres of uh, electrified railway in Tanzania, which is a first for the region. Um, and in its final capacity, it will be taking passengers all the way from the port city of Dar es Salaam uh, through to the administrative capital of Dodoma, which is actually in the northwest of the country, sort of north of the country. Um, it's uh, a project that has the potential to be immensely significant for the whole East African region and is expected to bring huge economic benefits and social benefits to Tanzania. Um, the full railway is actually being built in five lots, um, but you can just see lot one and two on here. So the blue lot, which is Dar es Salaam to Morogoro, uh, and then the red uh, line, that's lot two, and that's Morogoro to Makutapura. So about 80% of the railway is being built parallel to an existing metre gauge line. Um, and then there's about 20%, which is new track, uh, well, is on a new, new alignment. Uh, and this is mostly because the train is going to go a lot faster, about 160 kilometres, and they would pop off the bends if they hadn't got a new alignment. So the Arab um, IS, uh, the Arab IE, IE, SC, can't talk today, team, um, alongside our trusted subconsultants, are responsible for supporting delivery of the project in alignment with the uh, project lender's choice of international environmental and social standards. So we had a short introduction to those in the previous paper. Um, the team are very, our team are very proud of their achievements in helping the project obtain financial backing from international lenders in May 2020 and that feat led us to being nominated in the Transport and Infrastructure Project category at the IEMA Sustainability Impact Awards. Since October 2020 uh, we've been conducting quarterly environmental and social monitoring sessions for the project. Um, 
and um, been five in-country monitoring visits which have occurred since March 2022. Obviously this spans the COVID period so uh, international travel was a little bit more constrained. This led the team to undertake more innovative monitoring methods so we um, we had WhatsApp groups, Teams calls, Zoom calls, um, drone uh, flyovers, photography. It was really sort of how can we get information from point A to point B with actually uh, actually having to go out there. So we're working alongside the Tanzanian Railways Corporation, who are our end client, uh, the lenders who are financing the project, uh, contractors, subcontractors and other third parties to assist uh, in the innovative and pragmatic delivery of the project against a backdrop of immense environmental and social challenges. And these broadly for the, for the wider project, not specifically to cultural heritage, include restoration of livelihoods that are impacted by the project, uh, management of severance issues related to local populations who might be displaced from um, historic lands and areas that would occupied um, by the creation of the railway, um, the uh, achieving a no net loss or even possibly a biodiversity net gain. Uh, this is a first for me, the delivery of an elephant proof fence and ensuring that overall safe operation of a high speed electrified railway can take place in rural East Africa. Uh, our work is also helping build environmental and social capacity, knowledge and experience in the local Tanzanian teams on the ground, which is, is again something that refers back to one of the, the problems highlighted in the previous paper. Um, so despite the challenges we face, um, overall the Arab team are immensely proud of our ongoing work in Tanzania that is, uh, we're really committed to leaving a legacy of sustainability from this development. Okay. So whilst my intention really here is to highlight good practice and systems of working rather than um, summarise the cultural heritage in, in, in sort of classic sense of the area, um, we, it's really important to take a moment to recognise the deep time depth um, of cultural heritage in Tanzania. It lies along the Rift Valley, represents uh, a record of hominid and later human activity that could stretch back several million years. Um, paleontological and archaeological record in Tanzania contains valuable historical and cultural information on human development and activity from the Pliocene epoch uh, beginning in the early Stone Age through the Middle and Late Stone Ages. Later that's um, it's involved in the regional expansion of Bantu in the Iron Age. Uh, there's also growth of Swahili uh, international trading centres, which uh, was from about the 11th to 19th century. Then you've got the modern uh, European colonial period and then of course the, the post-colonial period. All of this is set against a rich ethnographic record of living heritage, which continues to evolve, uh, often retaining long-standing cultural heritage traditions and practices. So Tanzanian law uh, relating to cultural heritage is actually overseen by two ministries. Uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Tourism, who focus on um, our more familiar elements of cultural heritage, which is the, the tangible and movable heritage, uh, and the Ministry of Culture, Arts and Sports, who deal with intangible cultural heritage, and I use this as a, as a catch-all here, Indigenous Peoples. Um, the ministries coordinate um, the, the management of Tanzania's complex heritage using a framework underpinned by the uh, Cultural Heritage and Antiquities Act of 1964. Um, this was amended in 1979 and it does specify uh, the need for cultural heritage impact assessment to take place, but it doesn't actually say how this would be carried out. And this is also the first time that monuments and sites of national importance were granted um, a level of, of uh, legal protection. Um, a gap filling exercise um, was carried out in 2008 with the National Cultural Heritage Policy. And this attempted to refine some of the areas which the Antiquities Act um, didn't cover. And this also stipulated that cultural heritage impact assessment should be mandatory prior to development. However, it is widely acknowledged, um, mostly due to economic drivers, uh, that this is not always taking place. Finally, Tanzania also has a, a Graves Removal Act of 1969. And this prohibits the destruction of human burial sites, stipulating that they must be relocated if they will suffer any impacts as a result of development. So um, there are obviously, again, as previously mentioned, uh, a plethora of other uh, additional potentially applicable standards and guidance. Um, most relevant to cultural heritage in this capacity was um, the International Performance, um, International Financial Corporation Performance Standard 8, uh, which I will now just give a very quick overview of. Okay. So for those who are unfamiliar with it, um, very quickly, 
The International Finance Corporation defines itself as the largest global institution focused on the private sector, focused on the private sector in developing countries, um, with the aim of supporting um, investment in impactful projects, mobilising other investors, and sharing expertise. And in doing so, they aim to create jobs, raise living standards, um, especially for poor and vulnerable, vulnerable communities. I should stress they are not a lender themselves, but rather an organisation which supports lenders, um, as it's been a point of confusion for me in the past. Um, and the, they developed a set of performance standards uh, to help international lenders improve their business performance, enhance transparency, engage with the people affected by the projects they're financing, protect the environment and achieve greater development impacts. So sometimes um, when a loan is signed on a uh, development project from one of the international lenders, compliance with IFC um, performance standards will be um, one of the, will be written into the loan agreement. So if these are not deemed to be compliant, then the funding stream could be at risk, which is why these are often, so much importance is often placed on these in development work. So there are eight performance standards. Uh, most relevant to cultural heritage is um, uh, PS1, 8 and sometimes 7. So 8 is specifically concerned with cultural heritage. 1 concerns wider project risk management systems through the implementation of environmental management plans and systems of work. And then PS7 relates the treatment of indigenous populations. It was a fair point made in the previous, uh, previous presentation that that does not always cover all communities that are impacted by the development. Um, so that can sometimes overlap in uh, areas of intangible heritage and uh, living heritage. So I've summarised the key points here. I'm not going to read out the whole slide. Um, but if you Google International Financial Corporation Performance Standard 8, there is a nice long document you can all read if you are interested. So, okay. so early assessment on the project uh, identified the following key risks. So this is what we knew heading into the monitoring that we were trying to avoid based on the environmental social due diligence processes that have been carried out previously. Um, so we knew that there was risk to um, a loss of local heritage resources. Uh, there have been no nationally, um, uh, been no sites identified as nationally significant um, in Tanzanian law due to, uh, during the early um, Isha. So uh, we knew that we had potential that the main, the main issue was going to be graves. Um, there were also sacred sites, um, uh, baobab trees, um, mungugu trees and swamps. Now, these are much more difficult to identify without early proactive consultation with the local communities, as there is often nothing outwardly different about these areas to somebody who is not part of those communities. So it's really important, um, particularly for, for people on the ground to have those early proactive conversations. Otherwise, we're not fully going to understand the mitigation that we need to apply um, to the design or perhaps later on in conjunction with these communities if these are included in the area that's going to be impacted because we wouldn't know where they are. This is locally held knowledge by the people that live there. The other problem with building a large linear scheme is that you have the potential to cut people off from areas that they have previously had access to. So um, the, the current meter gauge railway, you can just step over the track. It's an old school, um, you know, they have diesel trains that run up and down that. Uh, the new one is an electrified railway. It's got um, the overhead cables and it's going to be, uh, it's going to have a large fence either side of it. So it's gonna be much more difficult for people to just cross either side. So we knew that that was going to be an issue. And then finally, um, one of the other risks is, is local satisfaction with the project as a result of the, the first two points. So the reason we were able to identify the risks on the previous slide at such an early, early stage and begin uh, risk management um, was because we had a strong hierarchy of project management systems um, in place already that was in compliance with performance standard one. Uh, this began with environmental and social impact assessments which were carried out by both the lender and also the client, so by um, uh, so the Tanzania Railways Corporation. And uh, these had already t gone some way to identify cultural heritage sites in the local area which went over and above those held in records by the Tanzanian government. Um, we then prepared, or rather the client then prepared environmental, social and management and monitoring plans um, which uh, identified how further data collection would be undertaken and set out the need for local stakeholder engagement, set out how this would feed into the project, and it also set out a mitigation hierarchy um, 
uh, of preference. So ideally you would avoid, and if you can't avoid, you reduce the impact, manage the impact, um, or you mitigate the risks associated with the impact. So the other three documents at the bottom detail how the uh, management procedures will actually be carried out on the ground. Uh, and I'd now like to talk about one of these documents in detail, which is the chance finds procedure, and that is our first case study. So, um, before I continue, I really want to just reiterate that what I'm talking about um, was enacted pretty much wholly by the Tanzanian Railway Corporation and our lead contractor on the ground, which is a Turkish company called Yap Yapi Mukesi, and their team, which is made up um, of, of uh, there are a combination of their employees and, and local Tanzanian um, uh, nationals. So um, this was simply observed by Arup during our monitoring of the project, captured and logged for reporting back to the lenders. So I know that the mention of a chance find policy is likely to be met with a lukewarm reception in a room of mostly British archaeologists, but these are the reality of standards on developments in much of the world where it's either impractical or largely unnecessary for works to be subject to a continual watching brief. And it's also explicitly stated as a um, requirement to be compliant with uh, performance standard eight. Um, for those who've not previously encountered a chance finds policy, these are documents developed by a project which outline the procedures to be expected cultural heritage sites or artefacts are encountered during construction. Uh, and whilst I concede this can be something of a, a blunt tool, pun semi-intended, the chance finds policy and associated uh, CPD opportunities, which were uh, provided as part of this project's induction for staff, were of an unusually high standard and not only optimise the potential for cultural heritage assets and artefacts to actually be identified as a result of the chance find policy, but it was also taken as an opportunity to increase general understanding of the importance of cultural heritage and why it should be protected. This slide so shows some excerpts of training materials which are actually developed in conjunction with uh, specialists at the University of Dar es Salaam, so Tanzanian um, archaeologists and academics at the university delivered as part of toolbox talks and also training inductions for the project workforce. So here we have some, uh, not particularly brilliant, sorry, pictures um, of examples of posters which were also produced in both English, well, in, in English, Turkish and also Swahili, which were displayed to the workforce in their welfare areas to remind them of their induction briefing on how to deal with any sites of cultural heritage significance which were identified during the works. Um, the reiteration of following proper procedures with regards to, to these sites um, represents uh, an unusually high commitment for compliance with PS8 and also develops the local team's understanding of good environmental and social practice as it is currently understood to be. It's not to say that it should be like that, but that's what it's right. So, uh, in compliance with the Cultural Heritage Management Plan, where work was carried out in areas known to be of heritage sensitivity, uh, they also gave additional toolbox talks on site and briefings. Um, these were given to the staff and that's what's going on in the top two pictures here. Uh, so the reason in this case for the briefings is the known presence um, of a grave of a former local, local chief, which was used by the community as part of religious and ritual practice. And this is what's shown in the lower two photos. In fact, that's Masary just there, I think, in the... Uh, the orange and yellow vis. And this was actually now located in a quarry pit, um, so a quarry which is, was going to become a borrow pit. So with regards to the grave at KM499, the project complied with PS10 in facilitating continued access to the site for community members uh, for as long as possible um, whilst the works were taking place. However, um, I want to use this as a case study um, in relation to PS, um, PS8. Point nine, which is consultation with affected communities, um, which is an area which um, the teams on the ground particularly excelled in. So in accordance with the stakeholder engagement plan and the environmental social monitoring mitigation plan, uh, teams from the client and construction partners undertook proactive consultation with the local community, uh, traditional elders, and also local government leaders on how best to approach future access following the repurposing of the, the area surrounding the grave as a borrow pit. Um, this was opened as an active dialogue at a really early stage, and they were exploring options that would include the grave being able to remain in situ, which is fairly unusual as often anything that's in the impact area is just automatically, um, it's just automatically uh, assigned to be removed or relocated. Um, so this really showed the, 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 the client's willingness to listen to and accommodate the belief systems and practice of the local communities which surrounded the project. Um, this 
also decreased the likelihood of conflict between the project and local groups and thus uh, adheres to the project mitigation hierarchy. So the consultation was carried out as part of an eight step um, engagement process, which was developed by clients um, and formed part of its PSA compliance. Records of those who attended were also kept, as well as meeting summaries and photographs to help provide comprehensive records of all these engagement activities. In the case of KM499, the decision was eventually uh, reached that it, well, they weren't going to relocate that burial. Um, and this was carried out with the full involvement of the local community and the relatives of the deceased. Similar exercises were carried out at several different uh, burial sites along the project corridor where relocation or removal of cultural heritage assets was consented. In these instances, the full eight shown were, were followed um, with either Yappy Mackaysey or the Tanzania Railway Corporation providing materials which could be used by the local communities in ceremonies relating to the removal or relocation of the site. Um, these sites of community cultural heritage are often both tangible and intangible in their nature in that um, the site's significance can be transplanted to a new area providing the correct procedures and rituals are undertaken. Um, letters were subsequently received and held on file following these processes, confirming that the communities were satisfied with the process. They were also issued with avenues to report any grievances, although I actually don't believe, I've, I've double checked this, I don't believe any were logged in this respect, which shows um, that, which is a result of this consistent and proactive uh, engagement process and strong, clear management processes from the off. So, um, as a summary, and what I would like you to take away today, uh, heritage, its assessment and mitigation strategies can take many different forms, depending on where in the world a project is based. Um, international Finance Corporation performance standards and other applicable standards, they provide a minimum set, which can actually be built upon to create really good project specific and appropriate heritage practice. Mm -hmm. And international finance in this sense can be a good thing, providing these are done uh, uh, in a, they are not carried in a cynical way and not just seen as a box ticking exercise. Strong management and well, strong management, well communicated systems reduce risk to the project and to cultural heritage and wider environmental disciplines and engagement with local specialists, local academic institutions and communities will ensure project policies and ways of working are always appropriate and tailored to the project specific needs. So thank you very much for listening. That is my contact details and any questions? <laughs>